to the HRC pledging event this year, which gives the candidates for membership for the 2020 to 2022 term of the Human Rights Council the opportunity to present their vision for membership and the priorities that they will work for during their term. The event has been organized by the International Service for Human Rights and Amnesty International, thanks to both of them, with the co-sponsorship of the permanent missions of Denmark, the Czech Republic, and Fiji. And I'd like to thank all the organizers and the co-sponsors. Today's event, as I mentioned, builds on similar events that have been convened for the last eight years by ISHR and Amnesty at uh, headquarters in New York and since 2016 here in Geneva. And the Mirror event in New York took place on September 6th. I wish to extend our sincere thanks to the 12 candidates who accepted the invitation to join us today, namely Armenia, Brazil, Germany, Indonesia, Iraq, Japan, Marshall Islands, Mauritania, Republic of Moldova, the Netherlands, Poland, and the Republic of Korea. I applaud their willingness to engage on human rights issues and thank them for approaching this exercise in the spirit of transparency and accountability. All candidates were invited to join us today, and I regret that four candidates declined to participate, namely Venezuela, Sudan, and Libya. That's actually three, right? Um, and we understand that the fourth African candidate is not yet decided, so of course they were not able to be invited yet. Uh, the event aims to strengthen dialogue amongst all stakeholders and deepen transparency. It recognizes the council's success depends on its members and their readiness to respond fully to the council's strong mandate set out in General Assembly Resolution 60251. It recognizes the importance of engagement and full cooperation with all stakeholders in the Council's work, which in turn requires outreach, information, and an enabling environment. Events such as this are an essential element to achieve that engagement. Open and transparent national consultations by candidate states with civil society and the public at large on their aspirations for membership are another. Similar consultations on achievements during membership and any challenges faced would also be desirable. In their opening segment uh, to the event today, each candidate has been asked to outline the measures it will put in place during its membership to meet the objectives of upholding the highest human rights standards in the promotion and protection of human rights and fully cooperating with the Council. Following the opening segment of the event, I'll open the floor to members of the audience who have questions for specific candidates. I will also take questions transmitted via Twitter, uh, hopefully not from the most prolific Twitter people. Um, in order to ensure questioning is balanced, each state will invite, be invited to respond to at least one question from the floor, and no candidate will be required to respond to more than two. I'll try to keep uh, that rule in place in, our, in all of our heads. If time remains in the final segment of the event, we'll ask the candidates to respond to an additional question. I look forward to the discussions which will take place over the next hour and a half. Uh, just to note that photographs uh, will be taken of the participants and of the event, uh, and the event itself will be recorded. If you would prefer not to be photographed, please indicate this to the photographer. To ensure the greatest opportunity for participation, the hardest part of my job here um, is that I will be imposing strict time limits on the speakers. Candidate states will each have two minutes to respond to the opening question and please try to stick to that time limit. You'll be assisted by an official timekeeper, who you'll be able to see at the side of the room here, who will indicate when one minute of speaking time remains and when time is up. <laughs> Very nice. The, the nice red sign. <laughs> um, and I'll open the floor to the candidates in alphabetical order in French to respond to the opening question, and then I'll do reverse order uh, in the final segment should we make it there. And again, thank you for your openness and to the audience for your interest in being here. So for the opening question, each candidate was sent the same question and I'll, I'll ask them to give their two minute response to it. The first question that was directed to all of the candidates is, General Assembly Resolution 60251 provides that members elected to the Human Rights Council shall uphold the highest human rights standards in the promotion and protection of human rights and fully cooperate with the Council. Could you outline the measures you have put or will put in place to meet these objectives both domestically and internationally? And so we'll uh, start, as I said, uh, alphabetically with uh, giving the floor first to the distinguished representative of Germany, Ambassador, I'm not sure where everybody is. Please, you have the floor.
Florister, Ambassador Michael Breher von Erger Sternberg. Thank you. Thank you very much, and also thank you to Amnesty International and the International Service for Human Rights for organizing this event. I will focus on three themes in my remarks. Multilateralism, human rights domestically, and human rights in German foreign policy. On multilateralism, <coughs> Germany is applying for membership of the Human Rights Council because we firmly believe in multilateralism and a rules-based international order. Human rights are one of our core policy priorities, both at home and in our foreign policy. In our view, the Human Rights Council is the UN's main forum to advance human rights through dialogue and cooperation, and also, where called for, through direct and frank discussions. Our aim is to strengthen multilateralism in an inclusive manner. Let me stress this, our approach is an inclusive one. We firmly adhere to the principles that human rights are universal, indivisible, and interdependent, and must therefore also be universally protected. These principles also guided us in past council memberships, including when Germany served as president of the Human Rights Council in 2015, and as vice president of the council in 2018. Let me now turn to the issue of human rights in Germany. Germany has made extensive commitments concerning the protection of human rights at home, and we are always open to views from other member states. We particularly value the Universal Periodic Review and the human rights treaty bodies. We know that we are not perfect and that we continually need to improve. The realization of human rights is by its very nature, in our conviction, a continuous and evolving task. Gender equality, rights of persons with disabilities, situation of refugees and migrants, Racism and anti-Semitism are some of the areas where we strive to do better. Madam Chair, finally, a couple of remarks on the role of human rights in German foreign policy. Our constitution requires us to work towards the promotion and protection of human rights worldwide, not just at home. We have shown leadership in a number of areas, helping to create, for example, a number of special procedure mandates. We believe it is important to not just focus on civil and political rights, but to address the whole spectrum of human rights. For example, Germany, together with other partners, has promoted the human rights to safe drinking water and sanitation, and the right to adequate housing. Thank you, Ambassador. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I've said that I will, and I need to be fair to all. Very strict. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm sure you'll have a chance to expand that in your answers to questions going forward. Thank you very much. Um, we will then move on to the, the next uh, alphabetically, which is the distinguished representative of our media, Ambassador Andranek Kolkatsian. Thank you very much for joining us. My country's aspiration to become for the first time a member of the Human Rights Council is anchored on the vision that human rights are universal, interdependent, and individual. It is our conviction that those countries that have not yet done so should be granted the opportunity to contribute to the work of the Council to bring fresh air and air. In the case of Armenia, if elected, we believe that our contribution will be based on the principles of peaceful democratic velvet revolution of last year that has been marked by landslide national progress in the fields of human rights and fundamental freedoms on the increased level of legal literacy and maturity of civic activity that inspired the Economist magazine to name Armenia last year as a country of the year. Armenia will continue to exert resolute efforts in promoting efforts against discrimination based on any grounds and promote the empowerment of women and girls. One example of this is Armenia's recent election to the UN Commission on the Status of Women. Armenia has developed efficient and result oriented cooperation with the OHCHR, UN mechanism and treaty bodies, including through the UPR process. This 2006 Armenia extended a standing invitation to all UN special procedures and independent experts. We have received five such visits so far. One key pledge of our candidacy to the Council is strengthening the dialogue and cooperation with civil society. Today we can confidently state that Armenia has succeeded in creating solid platforms for cooperation and engagement with civil society, also by the way of signing former civil society and human rights advisors to senior government positions. Finally, Armenia has been at the forefront of international campaign of the prevention of genocide and other mass atrocity crimes. We have initiated a number of HRC resolutions in this regard, and most recently the one that has been adopted in March 2018. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. And uh, we will next turn to the distinguished representative of Brazil, 
Ambassador Maria Nazareth Corane Azevedo. So now let's talk about what Brazil has done and will do as a member of the Human Rights Council. Brazil reaffirms its unwavering commitment to the highest standards of human rights, democracy, and rule of law. Brazil, Brazil's active activity in the Human Rights Council is intense. It covers many different areas. It is based on frank and pure dialogue with different countries from all regions of the world, civil society here present, uh, mandate holders, as well as the Office of the High Commissioner. Brazil will continue to play a leading role in almost 30 resolutions in the Council, including initiatives on the right to health, on the right to privacy in the digital age, human rights in the internet, and technical cooperation. Uh, we will uh, not shy away from our role in addressing systematic violations of human rights, especially in our region. We will remain engaged in addressing violence and discrimination based on origin, uh, sex, race, color, age, and other status, including LGBTI and other persons. Uh, persons with African descent, indigenous peoples, persons with disabilities, and human rights defenders, including environmental defenders and media workers, will also deserve our special priority. Particular attention will be given to freedoms of expression and association and to, the, and to religion's freedoms in all its forms especially to combat violence and persecution on the basis of religion and or belief. We will continue to draw attention to the detrimental impact of corruption in human rights. Oh, okay. So we'll receive three visits this year. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we'd like now to turn to the distinguished representative of the Marshall Islands, the Special Envoy on Human Rights, Junior Ani. Ani, uh, you have the floor now. Thank you. Thank you, ma moderator. Uh, a warm appreciation to all the organizers and uh, also the co sponsor of this event today, in case with the uh, member state and civil society on human rights issues. Uh, national commitments are an important part of our human rights campaign process. And the Marshall Island has submitted its uh, process and commitment in line with uh, UNGA Resolution 64 and 51. And we felt strongly that these are the we are new and action-oriented commitments. But let me highlight some of the, uh, the process that we put forward. We are a member of 11 core human rights treaties and associate uh, protocol. And we are committed to our political process to ratify <coughs> our constitution as a strong bill of rights with set out our political, personal, and social human rights. And, um, we have recently established our first human rights uh, committee as an institution that has the mandate to investigate what made and global human rights in the Marshall Island. We have an advanced judiciary system that continues to be recognized as our leader in accountability and government. We support the EPR process and committed to improve that area our commitment and uh, process highlights some of the core implementing challenges and we are committed to do that further. It's a low-lying low, low nation. Um, climate change was a threat to our nation and uh, development and security and we are committed to bring that uh, focus as well on uh, climate right issues. And um, nuclear is also part of our history but we are also committed to implement the uh, special repertoire on natural wind for time in the Marshall Islands. I guess I'm running out of time, but with that, I thank you, uh, Matt Madrid. Thank you very much. I'm now happy uh, to turn to the distinguished representative of Indonesia, Ambassador Hassan Kwik. Uh, you have the floor, please. Since 1998, Indonesia has periodically created the National Action Plan on Human Rights. We are now in the final year of the fourth generation of the plan and finalizing the fifth generation for the period of 2020-2024. Cities in Indonesia are also making tangible efforts in turning their cities as human rights cities. Being a democratic country with 263 million people spreading across thousands of islands, we are aware that it is inevitably that we are facing various 
type of challenges. The government is indeed firmly committed to continuously address those challenges. Indonesia put forward its candidacy based on our conviction that it could contribute in the works of the Council, as well as it could gain lesson learned experience to improve the enjoyment of human rights by its people. We are aware that becoming a member of the Council is not only a privilege, but also a responsibility to undertake the mandates of the Council, as well as to the constituencies at home and, as, uh, and constituencies at the UN member state who cast their vote based on their confidence that Indonesia could exercise fully the works and, and mandates of the Council in a responsible manner. And I thank you people for two minutes. Um, I'll now invite the distinguished representative of Iraq to take the floor, Ambassador Hussein Mohammed Akbar. Until 25 years of dictatorship, democracy was established in 2003, and the constitution was adopted, which embraces the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we had four national elections and three uh, local elections, which are good signs of uh, uh, guaranteeing human rights and choice and the freedom of choice. And uh, uh, we have established an uh, independent High Commissioner for Human Rights, which is uh, very well known for the UN in Geneva here. And uh, we are actively working within the HRC as a member uh, in promoting human rights, helping countries uh, to uh, facilitate the means and the ways to protect the human rights. And we have acceded to uh, all, nearly all the uh, core human rights conventions, and we are committed for reporting uh, and for re presenting our reports regularly in time, transparent. We have we welcome the human rights, uh, the sorry, the office of the uh, council in Baghdad and there is full cooperation with the council. The council members are visiting uh, prisons, going all around the country, welcomed by the prime minister, by all the government. And we, Iraq did not declare emergency rule despite all the years of fighting with Daesh, only to preserve the rights of the people there and to promote. We have uh, compulsory courses of human rights in all military, civil, uh, education, schools, and institutions. And we, Iraq, have adopted in 2010 an NGO law which facilitated the work of NGOs, which is a unique legislation in our area. Please think about our area and what's going on there. There is no discrimin gender discrimination. This is by law. We are proud to have the first minister, woman, woman minister in the area in 19, uh, 1958. Until now, the government of Baghdad is a minister. The, the, the head of the central bank was a minister. And we have, there are open invitation for the commissioner and all the uh, persons responsible in the UN to visit Iraq, and we are open for any criticism. criticism. Um, I'll now turn to the distinguished representative of Japan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of this meeting. Uh, Japan is uh, firmly committed to the promotion and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms as a universal value, according the highest standard of human rights guaranteed in our Constitution. Allow me to elaborate on uh, three points to demonstrate Japan's initiatives. First, Japan uh, served as a member of the Human Rights Council and has actively contributed to uh, discussions and uh, adoption of key resolutions, including the resolution on discrimination against people affected by leprosy. If elected, we will continue to cooperate with the Council and fellow members to promote and protect human rights throughout the world. Second, we believe that deliberations in the Council should be complemented and supported by measures taken by each member state. In this regard, recognizing the importance of dialogue and cooperation, Japan has held regular dialogues with, on human rights with individual countries, as well as to extend uh, by development cooperation. Third, all of the relevant government ministries and agencies in Japan have engaged in efforts to promote and protect human rights in various fields such as gender, rights of children, rights of persons with disabilities, LGBT, business and human rights. Japan will continue its efforts to promote and protect the human rights of all people, 
at home in order to realize a society where all people can make the best use of their abilities and find their lives worthwhile. To conclude, Japan believes that such efforts cannot be realized without the cooperation of the civil society. Japan will continuously endeavor to improve human rights situation both at home and abroad through dialogue and cooperation with the civil society. Thank you. The distinguished representative of Mauritania to take the floor. Um, I understand that Ambassador Mohamed El Habib uh, Bal would like to respond in French. We don't have translation, but just to note it for you. Thank you. Please, sir. Merci, madame. Je vais donc m'exprimer en français. La délégation de la Mauritanie vous félicite pour l'organisation de cet événement et vous remercie pour cette initiative et l'invitation qui lui a été adressée. Naturellement, nous regrettons de ne pas pouvoir bénéficier de, de, de traduction au moment même où nous sommes en train de célébrer le centième anniversaire du multilatéralisme. Or, le multilinguisme participe du multilatéralisme, plus rapidement en allemand. Cela étant dit, la République islamique de Mauritanie, je vous le rappelle, a été membre du Conseil des droits de l'homme pendant la, la période 2010 à 2013. Durant son mandat, elle a été élue au poste de vice-président du Conseil. Euh, pendant une année, c'est ainsi qu'elle attache une grande importance à la cause en faveur de laquelle le Conseil des droits de l'homme a été établi et a entièrement acquis aux objectifs de ce dernier. La Mauritanie adhère à tous les principes universels de droit international, du droit international humanitaire et du droit de l'homme. À cet égard, elle a enregistré ces dernières années de progrès notables quant au plan de renforcement et de la protection des droits civiques, politiques, économiques, sociaux et culturels, et celui du renforcement du cadre juridique de défense des droits de l'homme, l'amélioration des conditions de vie des détenus à des institutions carcérales, de la prévention de la torture, de la lutte contre tous les, toutes les pratiques nuisibles à l'enfant, à la femme et aux personnes du vent avec un handicap. La Mauritanie a ratifié toutes les principales conventions internationales et régionales dans le domaine des droits de l'homme. Et ses principaux protocoles facultatifs. Elle a également établi des liens étroits avec le comité de supervision de l'application de ces conventions par le biais d'une bonne collaboration avec les différents comités onusiens, arabes et africains. Cela se traduit par la présentation périodique des rapports et par un comportement positif et constructif à l'endroit des rapports spéciaux de ces institutions internationales. Parallèlement à ces efforts, le bureau du haut commissaire des droits de l'homme a été ouvert en Orchard, en plus de l'élection de notre pays à plusieurs comités onusiens. Je vous remercie. Merci, Ambassador. And we'll now uh, turn the floor to the Distinguished Representative of the Netherlands. The Kingdom of the Netherlands actively supports the observance of all human rights, ranging from economic, social, and cultural rights to civil and political rights. We pledge to fully cooperate with the Council to reach out to all states and to be a reliable partner for civil society. We will continue to respond on attacks, to attacks on civil society space, both offline and online, and speak out against reprisals. The King of the Netherlands sees the Sustainable Development Goals as the most effective prevention agenda. We promote the right to freedom of religion and belief, including the freedom to change one's religion, and the right not to profess any religion. We also advance the right to freedom of expression. We promote press freedom worldwide and condemn any violence against journalists and media workers. Our contributions strive to advance gender equality and the Council's capacity to promote and protect equal rights for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex persons. Where human rights violations have been committed, King of the Netherlands works to ensure accountability for perpetrators and justice for victims. We're self-reflective and continue to strengthen our human rights situation at home. We highly value human scrutiny. Smart multilateralism is needed to counter the increasing pressure on the human rights framework. The Human Rights Council is the primary UN forum where governments and civil society meet to define and advance human rights standards. The Human Rights Council is fit for this job, and as a member we pledge to equip the Human Rights Council to be even more responsive, inclusive and credible. Membership of the Council is not a free right. We pledge to practice at home what we promote internationally. I pledge to you that we will be your reliable partner to respect all human rights, to reach out to others, and to respond to human rights violations. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, for convening this meeting and congratulations to Amnesty International and International Service for Human Rights and co-sponsors for putting together this meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, Poland is a party to the majority of the core human rights instruments, particularly to the UN conventions and their optional protocols. We have already voluntarily participated in the three cycles of the Universal Periodic Review, making comprehensive efforts to implement recommendations received. Poland has extended and maintains a standing invitation to all United Nations human rights special procedures and fully cooperates with the international human rights mechanism. Poland, if elected to the Human Rights Council, 
will do its best domestically and internationally to uphold the highest standards in promoting and protecting human rights. Here I want to draw your attention to the following areas. One, we intend to work further on strengthening the link between peace and security and human rights. We focus our attention on the most vulnerable groups, children, persons with disabilities, but also religious minorities. We are proud to be among the initiators of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child four years ago, and we feel responsible to work towards social reintegration and rehabilitation of children who suffered in armed conflicts and humanitarian emergency. Equally important for us is to promote preventive measures to protect religious minorities and to eliminate gaps in protection of persons with disabilities. Two, protection and promotion of human rights is also crucial to achieving sustainable development in social, economic, and environmental dimension. We will do our utmost to promote the human rights principles and standards reflected in the Agenda 2030. Three, the link between the negative impacts of climate change and human rights is indisputable. We have been involved in climate change negotiations for a long time and given the vast international experience in this regard, we will work on this nexus, especially as climate change is undeniably one of the biggest threats the world is facing today and it needs to have a broader prominence as it endangers human rights and people livelihoods. Finally, we are convinced that the representativeness of the Human Rights Council should be reinforced and the UN member states that have not been elected to the Council so far should be more involved in its work. That is why Poland joined in 2018 the Voluntary Technical Assistance Trust Fund to support the participation of least developed countries and small island developing states in the work of the HRC. We have also pledged to provide financial contributions to the fund in this coming uh, years. I'd be very happy now to uh, invite the distinguished representative of the Republic of Korea. I'd like to thank the organizers of today's event, which I'm pleased to be a part of. The Republic of Korea upholds human rights as a centerpiece of its policy goals. As a party to seven core human rights conventions, the Republic of Korea is earnestly striving to implement them at the national level. To elaborate, the Republic of Korea drew up the third national action plan for the promotion and protection of human rights. The plan covers 272 tasks and outlines the Republic of Korea's commitment towards better human rights protection. The government is ensuring the fulfillment of international obligations by establishing various domestic measures, such as the first master plan for child policy, the fifth comprehensive policy plan for persons with disabilities, and the third basic plan for immigration policy. As a strong supporter of the UN Security Council resolutions on women, peace, and security, the government drew up the second basic plan for gender equality policy. The Republic of Korea also launched the new initiative of Action with Women and Peace to join global endeavors to protect and empower women in conflict. Having served as a member of the Human Rights Council for four terms, the Republic of Korea has actively engaged in major human rights issues. The Republic of Korea has also contributed to the expansion of the frontier of human rights issues by initiating resolutions on local government and human rights, and new and emerging digital technologies and human rights. In addition, Republic of Korea has extended a standing invitation to all thematic special procedures, resulting in eight visits since 2010. The government has held constructive dialogues with special procedures and will continue to cooperate with them. To conclude, Republic of Korea is endeavoring to strengthen strengthen human rights standards in all areas of life, both domestically and internationally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And we'll turn to our last candidate country, the representative of the Republic of Moldova. Ambassador Oksana Kovinci, please thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you to the organizers for having this event. Excellent. I'd like to start by underlining that in our view, the obligation to hold the highest human rights standards reflect a vision of our country where human rights are at the very core of our system and the system of values and all public policies, where every person without discrimination can fully enjoy human rights. To translate this vision into reality, the Republic of Moldova in the last year has taken complex measures at the legislative and policy level. There are at least two landmark documents to be mentioned, the law on equality and non-discrimination and the third national human rights human rights action plan developed in consultation with civil society and based on the recommendations of human rights mechanism. The institutional framework has been strengthened well, currently comprising the A status of the Ombudsman Office, the NPEM, the Equality Council, and the mechanism for reporting and for work formed by the National Human Rights Council and its secretariat. 
progressive steps were taken with regard to gender equality, civil society, the protection of victims of trafficking and domestic violence, and the complete reform of the child protection system. To give just one example uh, of the impact of gender policy, the current Moldovan government is 60% today. To see the prospective membership and the council as an opportunity for deeper self-reflection and as a catalyzer for further actions and coping together in the area of human rights. International Moldova operates fully of the council, having uh, received six visits of special procedure based on standing invitations, passed two new cards, and submitted the report on the implementation of all seven core human rights treaties that is part of two. During the, our first HRC membership and as observer, we have consistently supported the initiatives of human rights defenders, civil society space and preventive reprisal, contributed as member of the core group to the promotion uh, of the resolution on the death penalty, youth rights and conscious situation, have co-sponsored ambitious initiatives and advanced the debate on human trafficking, women in detention, youth rights and women, women peace and security by organizing side events on this topic. Last week, uh, as a leader in promoting gender equality, Moldova hosted uh, the sub-regional consultation in the implementation of the Beijing Declaration of the Program of Action. Thank you. All um, and that's the first part of the discussion. So now we're going to move on to the question and answer phase. Um, just to remind everybody, we'll take some questions from the floor. We'll give some of the states a chance to answer. We also have questions coming in by Twitter. Um, and the endeavor here is to try to ensure that every state gets uh, a chance to answer at least one question and, and two if um, possible and no more than that. So we will uh, try to balance it uh, between states as well. So I'd like to now open the floor for questions from the audience. Um, we ask you to ask concise questions to let us know if it's a general question or to direct it specifically to one of the candidates. Um, and please introduce yourself uh, when making a question as well. I see Australia, please. Thank you very much, and um, thank you to uh, all of the candidates today who presented uh, their pledges for a spot on the Human Rights Council. Um, resolution 6251 setting up this council over 10 years ago makes it clear that council members shall uphold the highest standards in the promotion and protection of human rights and to fully cooperate with the council. To further those requirements, in 2018, Australia led an incoming member's pledge to strengthen It includes, in summary, a commitment to cooperate in good faith with the OHCHR, to address human rights concerns on their merits, to engage in the work of, this, of the Council in a spirit of self-reflection, good faith and in a transparent manner, to avoid procedural tactics when used to block genuine debate, work to fulfil the Council's prevention mandate, plan to progress the promotion of human rights um, at a national level, and to work in cooperation with civil society. I would commend the pledge to all of the potential new members and I'm interested to hear whether any of the, the candidates are already considering joining the pledge. Thank you. Thank you very much. I saw a question in front. Please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Gustavo from Connectus Human Rights, an NGO based in Brazil. And my question is towards Brazil. But first, we'd like to express our regret that many regional groups so far are running on a clean slate. I would like to repeat a question made to the Brazilian delegate at the pledging event in New York that he decided not to answer. How Brazil plans to engage with the OHCHR considering the recent attacks of President Bolsonaro towards the High Commissioner? And finally, the Brazilian president publicly praises leaders of the most repugnant dictatorships in Latin America who tortured and murdered many people. The 2019 pledge does not address the issue of torture, and a couple of months ago, the president issued a decree that basically makes the national mechanism to prevent and combat torture inoperative. Could you elaborate on how this domestic scenario of many setbacks plays out with one of the most basic criteria to be a council member, that is to uphold the highest standards in the promotion and protection of human rights? Uh, we would also like to thank the candidates uh, for the presentation and Amnesty International and uh, SHR and the co-sponsors for convening this uh, meeting to have uh, 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 to engage with the candidates here in New York, here in 
in Geneva as well. Uh, I would just raise, like to raise two points. Um, for Liechtenstein to uphold the high standard in promotion and protection of human rights and to cooperate with the Council and other relevant human rights institutions and mechanisms also means to prevent the prevention of atrocity crimes, namely genocide, crimes against humanity, war crime and war crimes of all which consist of human rights violations. Therefore, we urge those candidates who have not yet done so to give due consideration to supporting the Code of Conduct regarding Security Council action against genocide, crime against humanity and war crimes, as elaborated by the ICT group. Liechtenstein's support of candidacy strongly depends on a candidate's support of the Code of Conduct. Furthermore, we think that the term and the Human Rights Council should also be seen as an occasion to also continuously work on the improvement of the domestic human rights situation. This includes the strong protection of human rights defenders, in, uh, uh, defenders including those who cooperate or seek to cooperate with the United Nations. The last report on this issue shows that many countries engage in reprisals against their own civil society activists including countries running for this council. As we are currently negotiating the resolution on reprisals, we would like to hear from the candidates how they would like to use their term in order to improve the domestic human rights situation in general and how they would like to ensure the protection of human rights defenders, be it in individuals or groups. In addition, we'd also like to know how the candidates plan to engage with special mandate orders or other relevant human entities to promote Thank you. Let me begin by thanking the <coughs> International Service for Human Rights, Amnesty and the co-sponsors Denmark, Fiji and the Czech Republic for organizing this important event and create the opportunity for dialogue with the candidates to the council. Iceland supports the, this exercise fully and participated in a pleasant event last year. I would also like to thank all the candidates here today and for pre presenting their vision for council membership. From our perspective, it is essential that candidates for council membership show clear commitment to upholding the highest standards in the promotion and protection of human rights, as is stated in the founding resolution of the council, and that they be ready to face increased scrutiny during their membership. Uh, <clears throat> participating in today's event is an important first step in this regard. Uh, Madam Chair, I have a general question. We believe that human rights are universal. They must apply equally to all people, in all places, and at all times. And that includes the human rights of LGBTI individuals. Over the past years, we have seen important progress made towards the respect of the rights of LGBTI individuals, a topic that Iceland made a priority during its membership of the Human Rights Council. We would therefore like to ask the candidates how they intend to use their membership to promote the rights of LGBTI individuals. So I'll take a question on this side from Forum Asia, um, and then we'll go back to the States. Thank you very much. My name is Rosanna from Forum Asia. My question is for Indonesia. How will Indonesia respond to human rights crises in other ASEAN states, including the situation of the Rohingya and other minorities in Myanmar, through the Human Rights Council? Thank you very much. So this is where it gets a bit tricky because we have a number of general questions and some specific ones. What I'd like to do is I'm going to turn to the states that were asked specific questions and I'll give you a chance to respond both to the specific question you were asked and then to pick up general <coughs> questions. We had general questions on a variety of subjects, um, including the Australian pledge and your willingness to pick it up and, and uh, afford your behavior within the council to it. Um, the issues of the Code of Conduct on mass atrocities, um, the protection of human rights defenders domestically, and uh, engagement with mandate holders as raised by Liechtenstein, and Iceland's question about uh, the, how states intend to promote the rights of LGBTI individuals. So um, if you don't mind, Ambassador, I think I will turn to the Ambassador of Brazil first as there was a specific question for you uh, relating to uh, torture mechanisms and upholding the highest standards in that regard within Brazil and your, your work at the Council. And then feel free to pick up any of the general questions that you would like. So the first one, uh, let me say that the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Affairs has issued a press release. We have copies of that here 
on September 4th regarding the comments made by the High Commissioner during the press, uh, <coughs> sorry, the press conference last week. Those interested in this, uh, in read the press release number 228 of Brazil, we have a copy here and we can give it to you. The Brazilian government remains very much available to engage in a frank and objective dialogue with the High Commissioner and your office <coughs> to provide any relevant information in order to prevent unnecessary misunderstandings. Uh, whenever the High Commissioner and mandate holders wish to make a statement about Brazil, uh, we, uh, we are actually very much engaged with the Office of the High Commissioner, with the team, special rapporteurs, mandate holders, civil society working around the Human Rights Council. We have a standing invitation for mandate holders to come to Brazil. We have the highest number of visits uh, being paid for a country in, in, uh, in the United Nations, around 25 to 26 special rapporteurs have come to Brazil, so our engagement and dialogue is very fruitful. We are committed, as I said, to receive three visits this year. One is, has already happened, another one we are holding talks with the special rapporteur this week here to, to prepare the visit. And we are sure we are an example and a source of inspiration for many in, with regard to um, human rights. Um, with regard to torture, Brazil acknowledges uh, its obligations to <clears throat> effectively fight and prevent torture. In 2013, we established our national system for preventing and fighting torture. The National Committee for the Prevention and Combat of Torture opened to civil society. Uh, participation is in charge of debating and streamlining the national policy to prevent and fight torture. I see my time is up. I would like also to take on the issue of LGBTI, but I'll, I think I'll have another chance later. Um, what I want to say is that the policy and the facts are what's, what's, uh, what's driving Brazil, and I believe that we have a very good track on uh, human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so that states have a chance to think about the questions before I put it to you. I'm going to read off some of those questions. Um, one of them actually is another question for Indonesia as well, so I'll mention that in case, sorry, in case you are interested in answering that one as well uh, when I turn to you, which will be next, Ambassador. Um, the question from Twitter for Indonesia was, when will Indonesia recognize and uphold rights to free expression, association, assembly, participation, and self-determination in West Papua? Um, there was a question as well for Japan, um, actually two questions for Japan. Uh, does the government propose to end indefinite detention in immigration centers in violation of international law? And will Jap Japan accept the jurisdiction of treaty bodies over individual complaints, helping to translate international law into national change? Um, for Iraq, the question was raised, what steps will Iraq take to increase women's participation in branches of government, a point that the ambassador had raised in his statement, uh, and noting that uh, currently, according to their, the statistics in the Twitter question, comprises only 1% of the executive and 5% of the judiciary. And then finally, for Germany, uh, there was a question, how will you ensure that bilateral interests, especially trade and investment, do not prevent you from taking meaningful action at the HRC to improve the human rights situation in China? Uh, so those are some challenging questions from our, our Twitter feed for all of you. Um, as well as a general question, which states will be able to respond to, um, which is, what efforts will you take to promote civil society participation, both at the HRC and around the world, which of course is a question that has been asked by several of the states as well. So with that, I'd like to give the floor, uh, I see you writing quickly, so I'll, I'll delay my speaking very much. There, please, Ambassador. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I try to, to, to answer uh, briefly some questions. Uh, first, on uh, the uh, first is uh, on Myanmar, on, on the issue of Rohingya. There are three issues that uh, I think we need to continuously focus on. Humanitarian, human rights, as well as accountability. So both have to be, the three of it have to be undertaken in parallel. Nothing can single each other out. 
So uh, the priority right now is how to save the Rohingya, how to make sure the repatriation take place in a safe, dignified, and peaceful manner. Uh, we continue to work with Myanmar, uh, try to push Myanmar to create conditions conducive for the return. And when we are going to be in the council, we are going to continuously uh, contribute greatly in making sure that the issue of Rohingya could be settled sooner rather than later. The most important thing that we need to take care of is the humanitarian and humanitarian uh, human rights aspect of the Rohingya, while at the same time, in a parallel track, we could continue on the issue of the accountability. The real impact on the ground can only be done with the constructive engagement, because without any cooperation from Myanmar, we cannot do anything inside that country. So I think constructive engagement with all uh, multi-stakeholder is needed. Afterward, we can continue to uh, play a role in finding uh, in addressing the root causes. Indonesia will continue to engage, ASEAN has continued to engage, and we would like to other as well to make sure that at the end of the day, this issue can be settled to the safe, dignified, and voluntary return of the Rohingyas to the Rakhine like State. Uh, that's on, on, on the Rohingya. And uh, secondly, on, on the freedom of assembly, freedom of uh, expression, this is a very casuistic because you are referring me to one issue, uh, uh, internally uh, issue. So I just would like to, 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 to affirm that being, being a democratic country, we guarantee freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. We facilitate the utmost possible of such peaceful assembly. I know, without saying it, they are referring, time's up. <laughs> <laughs> you give me so many questions and yeah. time's up. Okay, so, so as you will see, I was giving you a little bit extra because I did put two questions to you. So but why don't we give him one more minute to finish the answer. Sit down, please. Okay. Uh, this issue, this issue, I know that it's referred to, it was happening right now, but it has been calmed down. The regulatory remarks as trigger factor. So what I would like to, 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 to uh, underline here, that regretfully, the peaceful uh, demo, uh, freedom of expression becoming anarchist, uh, burning public facilities, vandalism, security personnel has restrained, maximum restraint, and non-use of force. Uh, we have to, to balance the freedom of expression and maintaining public order. Lastly, last one, on the self-determination. The referendum was fully uh, undertaken in 1969. The people of Papua once and for all reaffirmed that Papua is an irrevocable part of Indonesia. The result of the referendum was final and cemented by the UN General Assembly Resolution 12 2504-1969. Once the referendum was held and done, it's final. And the reprocable, legally speaking, referendum or self-determination could not ever be repeated. Thank you. Um, I'll turn now to Japan. Um, again, I did ask two questions. Um, if you want to take three minutes to respond to the two questions, uh, you can. Um, and the, uh, I'll give the floor now to the ambassador. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, Japan regards the individual communications uh, procedures as uh, important in the sense that they could effectively contribute to guarantee the implementation of human rights uh, treaties. Uh, at the same time, we examine issues such as whether there are any problems in introducing this in relation to Japan's uh, judicial system and legislative policy and the kind of system that would need to be established for implementation of the individual communication procedure if uh, Japan decides to introduce this. As part of that, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs held the 20th workshop in April this year to discuss the individual communications procedure between relevant ministries and experts. Japan will continue to engage in the discussion on this matter seriously while taking various options, uh, opinions uh, into account. Uh, the other question on the uh, refugee facilities, uh, I'm still checking with uh, uh, Tokyo, and uh, so maybe I will uh, raise a uh, later. Thank you, ma'am. I'm glad with this question, really. Uh, 
we are proud in Iraq to be the country which has the highest uh, participation, possibly one of the highest participation of women in society, and uh, either in politics or judiciary. We have even uh, women who have been imprisoned for pol their political activities in the time of dictatorship. Uh, and uh, at the moment, the Iraqi constitution uh, uh, mentions that 25% of the parliamentarians should be women. Every two parliamentarian third should be a woman. Now we have 33% of the parliamentarians are women. And uh, now we have the first, uh, for the first time, deputy uh, head of the Judi Judiciary Association in Iraq is a woman. 5% of the judiciary is women. I think it's a progress we made from the previous record, if you compare it with the previous record. Uh, and uh, anyway, the composition of the, 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 uh, the uh, Minister's Council have adopted uh, and uh, created a high commission to promote women position in society, and this is headed by a woman who is the governor of Baghdad. Several decisions, decisions have been taken to promote the position of women. We are working closely with the UN, with the uh, office of the UHRC in Baghdad in ways to promote, to activate women, to form their societies, to be more active, more involved in, in politics and uh, social work, and they are doing so. We have committees of women parliamentarians, uh, committees of NGOs headed by women. We have uh, uh, Iraq, uh, the, the government have uh, supported the first uh, business women's association in Iraq, so we are working on it. We know we need to do more. Our membership of the council will help us to do more, to work vigorously, to enforce the law, and to use our resources to uh, promote women. We Next month, we present our report to CEDAW, and I hope the uh, questionnaire could follow it. Thank you. Um, and the last specific question that I had read out was to Germany, so I will turn the floor to you, Ambassador. Please. Thank you. That was the question on uh, our relation with China. Um, and the question was whether our trade and business interests were going to interfere with our um, approach and human rights in China. Germany has very extensive relations with China in all areas. That covers business and economic area, but also, of course, political issues, cultural issues and also human rights. That's very important. We have a bilateral dialogue with China on human rights, and we express our concerns quite, quite openly. Um, we have also addressed these issues in the Human Rights Council uh, under item four. We have addressed these issues in the UPR, and we have recently written a letter with a group of countries uh, uh, addressing certain concerns we have. So to sum up, we, we, we speak out uh, both behind closed doors and openly, but we want this dialogue to be a constructive one and to promote the human rights. So that is very important. May I address one question which came from the floor before? Sure. That was from Liechtenstein, and it allows me to say something which would I, I would have said in my initial remark had you not uh, cut, cut, cut me off. <laughs> it um, concerns the uh, um, agenda of um, um, accountability. Germany is a firm supporter of accountability and uh, a colleague from Liechtenstein was speaking about genocide, crimes against humanity and war crime. We believe that ICC is extremely important but we also believe that institutions like the uh, ind independent mechanism on Myanmar and the triple IM on Syria are extremely important. We have, con we have consistently supported these institutions uh, both uh, financially and politically. And he also addressed the issue of prevention. Um, we believe that um, when we are in the Council, we will be able to uh, strengthen the links between the Council and the Security Council. That is, I think, a very important aspect. We've done that in the past. Uh, uh, we have been instrumental in uh, trying to get uh, Ms. Bachelet to the Security Council. So uh, we are um, going to try and continue down that vein. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, so those were the specific questions that, that I had already read out. Um, what I'd like to do now is go back to the floor and uh, we'll take a, a few more of those who wanted to raise questions. And I do have uh, a, a large group of additional questions that have come in by Twitter. So we saw uh, Bulgaria had a, had a question, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Excellencies, dear colleagues, I would like to start by thanking the main sponsors and organizers of this event and the candidates for their presentations, of course. 
We all know how important it is to have time and space for transparent and uh, genuine dialogue of the future membership of the Human Rights Council. We ourselves uh, sat in the same front row just one year ago and know from experience that by reviewing the pledges of the upcoming member states, we benefit from each other's experience and good practice. Indeed, we all pledge for upholding the human rights system both internationally and uh, domestic level, and we've heard the candidates uh, uh, what, uh, and we've heard by the candidates what steps they will undertake to meet the expectations. At the same time, we are facing everyday new and emerging uh, challenges. In light of the above, we would like to address a question to all the countries present. If elected, what will you do to guarantee that the Human Rights Council responds adequately to the very rapid technological development and its impact on human rights, especially those of the most vulnerable groups, like people with disabilities, children, etc. I thank you. I believe UNHCR had uh, raised their flag for a question. Thank you. Um, I will be very brief. Uh, thank, uh, we would like to thank to all organizers for convening this important event. And uh, we have two general questions. One, um, how do the candidate states intend to tackle the questions related to forced displacement? So we heard a bit from Germany, but also the other candidate states. And if elected, how do the candidate states plan to enhance collaboration with special procedures mandate holders at country level to gear more protection outcomes for refugees, internally displaced persons, and stateless persons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Azerbaijan? Thank you. I'm sorry, can I, uh, can I ask a specific question now? Yes, please. I want to address a question to the representative of Armenia. How would the membership of Armenia to the very respected body of United Nations that is responsible for promoting universal respect for all human rights, would reconcile with Armenia's disrespect to international law and charter of the United Nations as a country that keeps the territories of Azerbaijan under military occupation by using of force and aggression, as a result of which, among others, economic, social, and cultural rights of more than 800,000 Azerbaijani internally displaced persons have been being violated paying specific attention to the fact that this violation is recognized by the European Court of Human Rights in the face of this judgment in Chiragov and Others versus Armenia case, dated 16 July 2015. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Bogdan, did you have a question for the other candidates? Okay, we'll come back then. Um, all right, so why don't I then uh, take the opportunity to read out um, some of the other questions that have been raised. Um, there was um, another question for Armenia, so I'll put that on the table as well, uh, which is that uh, the Twitter uh, comment was that there have been campaigns conducted <coughs> against LGBTI and women human rights defenders are on the rise. How does Armenia plan to protect human rights defenders and fulfill the UN declaration? Um, there was also um, uh, a question from Mauritania. Uh, which was Mauritania appeared in the UN uh, Secretary General's reprisals report. How do you intend to uphold your human rights commitments uh, if you uh, retaliate against those who report to the UN? And there was a question for Moldova. Will Moldova commit to holding consultations on priorities with civil society at home before each session if they become a member? And for Poland, how will you strengthen domestic human rights, including addressing significant issues around the independence of the judiciary and the rule of law in the context of HRC membership? And then finally, for Korea, Republic of Korea, does Korea have plans to enact a legal definition of racial discrimination and penalize public expressions of racism and xenophobia? So those are a broad range of questions for those countries. Um, I should also note for Poland that there was a, a second question that was raised, uh, which is comprehensive sexual education is essential to realization of the right to health. Why is it being eroded in Poland, and how will Poland promote uh, this uh, issue at the 
uh, Human Rights Council. Okay, so a broad range of questions, and of course we do have um, a growing number of general questions that states have been asked as well. So I will, I think, um, start with, if you don't mind, given that I've asked several questions of some states, um, Armenia, would you uh, be willing to go first? There were two questions directed to you, please. Thank you, Madam Moderator. <clears throat> In several questions directed to us. First one, Azerbaijan questions coming from a delegation of Azerbaijan. And I think this is the beauty of the Human Rights Council, where the representative of a country with, uh, <coughs> I would say, poor human rights record dares to ask questions about uh, uh, human rights. And this is the beauty, I think, of the Human Rights Council. And uh, if elected, I would like to contribute to the diversity of the Human Rights Council, because all voices should be heard. Coming back to the question of Azerbaijan, of course it's a politically motivated and I will not go into the, all the details of it, just to mention that uh, there is no such a uh, ruling of European Court of Human Rights, as mentioned by the delegate of Azerbaijan, because the European Court of Human Rights by default doesn't make any political rulings, and this is uh, envisaged in the European Convention of the Human Rights. And, uh, to assert the contrary is just an erroneous uh, and uh, not right. Uh, to the second question directed to Armenia, we firmly believe that violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation should never be tolerated. We will continue to work with all relevant stakeholders to end the discrimination and violence on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, Couple of general questions, if you allow me, one on the human rights defenders, repressors, and civil society. The human rights defender of Armenia was accredited with A status by the International Coordination Committee of National Human Rights Institutions. He visited the Human Rights Council twice within one year uh, and contributed to the discussions of the Human Rights Council. Um, by the way, our Minister of Foreign Affairs also visited twice within one year the Human Rights Council, which shows how much importance Armenia attaches to the Human Rights Pillar of the Human Rights Council. And finally, on the uh, issue raised by Liechtenstein, on Sorry, the joint code of conduct, we are considering positively joining the code of conduct. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, if I could now uh, then turn the, the floor to um, Mauritania on the question that was asked of you, sir. So apparently we've, we've now given it to you in French so that you'll be able to. Can we um, just ask Moldova then to, to take the floor? First, uh, on the question uh, regarding the civil society, the impact of the to the important role of, of the civil society actors whose contributions were considered a vital to genuine democracy, including in the work of, uh, of the Council. And the rule of law best to ensure that their work continues to be held by creating a safe and enabled environment for all those who uh, work for different uh, for their defending of human rights. The Republic of Moldova has a vibrant and very active civil society and uh, the government is firmly uh, uh, commented, to, uh, commented to work with civil society and to work its strengthening. Uh, recently the government approved uh, the last uh, uh, national strategy on the development of civil society uh, which is uh, set very clear uh, the national commitment in order to improve the participation of civil society to the decision making. Uh, the, the civil society has uh, their place on the, um, uh, on the uh, national mechanism to follow uh, the, uh, the human, rights, uh, uh, human rights implementation, human rights action plan. It is part of national human rights mechanism. Uh, and uh, I am personally uh, very committed to work with uh, civil society before uh, the council and after the council and during all the years and uh, taking my previous experience I also was a politician in the country who worked closely with civil society and they know very much the value uh, and the, uh, the value of the voice of the civil society and we together uh, can do better and can do more. 
um, we also uh, approved several legislation, uh, several law in the Republic of Moldova in order to uh, ensure financial sustainability for civil society, uh, the so-called 2% law designed to improve the financing of civil society organizations. Uh, then uh, let me uh, answer it a bit on other questions if possible. On the question of uh, Liechtenstein, we are proud to specify I'm sorry, that was time that was a few minutes for you. So uh, given that we are getting a little close, I'm going to have to be strict on that. Sorry about that. Um, if we could now turn to Poland, uh, you had two questions, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to answer the questions that have been uh, posted by a by Twitter. First question uh, refers to the independence of judiciary in Poland, and here I can say that the rule uh, of law principle is crucial for Poland, and undoubtedly one of the foundations of the, de the democracy is an independent judiciary. And this fundamental rule has a reflection in the Polish constitution, it stipulates in Article 173 that the courts and tribunals shall constitute a separate power and shall be independent uh, of other branches of power. Uh, I would stress that all the judicial reforms undertaken by Poland in recent years aimed at improving the functioning of the Polish judiciary system, which encountered serious organizational problems resulting in, uh, among others, serious protracted court proceedings, which was noted in numerous judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. It also must be noted that no judgment has yet been issued against Poland by the European Court of Justice in which the independence of the Polish judiciary would be called into question. If such a judgment is to be delivered, I am deeply convinced that Poland will take its findings into consideration very seriously as a country which always respects international law and international court judgments. As far as the next question is uh, concerned uh, about the sexual, uh, comprehensive sexual education, uh, here I would like to answer that the comprehensive sexual education is being provided uh, in accordance with the Polish uh, national law, and it is present in the school curricula. Uh, but the guiding principle is that uh, the rights and duties and the responsibilities of parents and other persons legally responsible for, the, for adolescents uh, with appropriate direction and guidance from parents and legal guardians should be safeguarded in the process of providing this uh, sexual uh, uh, education. <laughs> And third, if I may. Sorry, was that two minutes or three minutes? Two minutes. Yes, uh, the, the question that uh, was posed by the Supreme Representative of Liechtenstein about the ACT Code of Conduct. Here I would like to answer briefly that, that Poland support the, the accountability, the idea, and as a current <coughs> member of the Human Rights Council, Human, uh, United Nations Security Council, it will fulfill its obligation and as a member will not vote against any any uh, serious uh, draft re resolution aimed at uh, preventing uh, the mass atrocities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, discretion, discrimination on the grounds of race, color, descent, or national or ethnic origin, as defined in Article 1, Panel 1 of the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, is prohibited by the principle of non-discrimination under Article 11, Panel 1 of the Constitution of the Republic of Korea and the laws embodying the principle. Furthermore, victims of discrimination on the grounds of race, color, ethnic origin can complain it to the National Human Rights Commission according to National Human Rights Commission Act. National Human Rights Commission can recommend remedies, system improvements, disciplinary action, and so on. And the issue of establishing a hate crime law that covers hate crimes based on race will be carefully reviewed, factoring in the balance with the current criminal laws. In fact, in Korea, if violence resulting from racial discrimination consti uh, constitutes a crime such as assault, libel, or insult, it is subject to criminal punishment under the current law. Thank you.
sont massacrés par l'architecte du de notre constitution. À ce jour, il n'y a aucun détenu politique ou d'opinion en Mauritanie. Il y a une foultitude de lois qui régissent, qui garantissent euh, ces lois fondamentales. Euh, et la Mauritanie a connu une évolution constante dans la promotion de la liberté de presse et d'expression. Le pays s'est hissé plusieurs années consécutives au premier rang dans le monde arabe en matière de liberté de presse. Et suite à la libéralisation de l'audiovisuel et d'autres mesures telles que la dépénalisation du délit d'opinion, le paysage dynamique s'est émergé, a émergé. Aujourd'hui, la montée du compte de 10 chaînes de radio, etc. Alors, c'est pour vous dire que la Mauritanie considère que les organisations de la société civile sont un important levier de la participation citoyenne et à l'élaboration, la mise en œuvre et le suivi des politiques publiques ainsi que la consolidation de la démocratie et des droits de l'homme. Il existe aujourd'hui dans le pays plus de 6 000 associations nationales, 62 ONG internationales, 18 000 coopératives. Et notre pays collabore de la manière la plus fructueuse avec nos commissariats euh, des Nations Unies. Euh, alors, je ne sais pas si j'ai répondu à votre question, mais c'est ce que j'avais pour vous. Je vous remercie. Merci, Jean-Mathieu. Je vais essayer de the question whether any of the member candidates uh, will consider joining uh, other countries to process. I, and I think this is a very great point that was made and the, uh, the Marshall Island welcome the, uh, the cooperation. And looking at what Marshall Island has done internationally, so we are very focal on climate change and our role as island in our policies that we will work with the um, perhaps a few uh, a few things. First of all, we uh, welcome Australia's pledge uh, based on the Dutch-led joint statement on membership engagement of June 2017. We fully agree with uh, the points made by Liechtenstein on the uh, prevention agenda. With regards to um, efforts on civil society participation, uh, we believe it is of the utmost importance to support and protect civil society engagement at the international level. Without CSOs and human rights defenders and journalists, we cannot focus our discussion on the, on the right issues. Um, we always stand ready to meet with CSO representative and human rights defenders and any form of reprisals for those seeking to cooperate with the UN and its mechanisms is unacceptable and we continue to speak out against reprisals against human rights defenders. Perhaps the last point uh, of UNHCR on special procedures. Uh, we do have a standing invitation and we take recommendations of special procedures very seriously. And our forthcoming national action plan on human rights will reflect our universal periodic review of 2017 and the recommendations preserved, uh, received by the, by the treaty bodies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, the question uh, was a little bit uh, unclear uh, on the point about uh, whether this is a refugee question or whether it's about illegal uh, uh, people with illegal stay in Japan. Um, on the first, if it's, a, if it's the refugees, uh, we Japan basically uh, considers uh, is, uh, whether to uh, uh, protect and uh, accept uh, the uh, refugee uh, applicant uh, by uh, considering uh, well, making proper decisions on the status of a residence based on humanitarian grounds and the uh, status under the refugee convention. Uh, however, uh, if it's a question of the immigration management center, where there are people who uh, have been detained because they uh, were in Japan uh, without uh, legal uh, status or whether they committed crimes in Japan. Um, there, there is, a, it's inaccurate to say that it's indefinite detention in the sense that this is not a penal facility. So uh, there is no uh, limit, but on the other hand, uh, we feel they can leave uh, Japan based on the uh, Quotation order as soon as they can. So we're not limiting them to stay. You know, we want them to leave. Thank you. So there were a number of general questions that uh, were not answered in depth, and some states indicated a desire to respond to those questions. So for those states who only had two minutes, um, could you put up your placards if you would like one more minute uh, to answer some of the general questions? And I'll go around the room and, and take 
uh, those states. Uh, I'll turn first to Brazil. Thank you. I'd like to, to, to respond to the question on LGBTI. I think this is a, an issue that raises a lot of passion and we need some facts and, and data. So Brazil, I would like to say that Brazil remains fully committed to the protection of the rights of LGBTI persons. Uh, the, uh, the Minister of Human Rights, when she was here, uh, she reiterated our determination to combat violence and discrimination against LGBTI, LGBTI people. Brazil remains uh, a member of the core group of the resolution on this issue in the Human Rights Council. And um, I think it's also very important for all to know that the, according to the Brazilian law and jurisprudence, same-sex couples enjoy the right to marry, to legalize civil, their civil union, and to adopt children in the same conditions according to any other heterosexual couple. Thank you. I'll turn now to the Marshall Islands. Thank you again. Uh, I would like to put more emphasis on uh, gender issue and uh, women. Um, Marshall Island has been a long firm of uh, sexual and productive health for the Indians protection on uh, women. And, and uh, we have a uh, high rates of uh, domestic violence in our country uh, as much as that of the women in Marshall Island experience just violence. And uh, some of the judicial uh, legislative and uh, policy reform that helped address this issue um, they, it's been a long process and we have done so much. We uh, test a stand, um, stand, stand alone uh, law on domestic violence. And uh, Marshall Island is, is one of the, uh, the first countries in the uh, Pacific region to have women president. And we also represent uh, youth problems, but at the same time, we also represent uh, a child. But our commitment on the GCU is very important for us and we will advance uh, and promote Madam Chair, uh, about the cooperation with special procedures, uh, we've extended the standing invitation to all the thematic procedures uh, in 2008, and so far we've invited eight special procedures. And uh, in addition to that, uh, we've also supported the working group on enforced or involuntary disappearances to hold its session in Seoul in year uh, 2017. Also, we've uh, made financial contributions to the Coordination Committee of Special Procedures to support collaborative activities of 56 special procedures. I'd like to share uh, with that, uh, with you about that information. And uh, about the civil society. In the Republic of Korea, decades of civil society activism inculcated a sense of ownership and participation among the public. So civil society has played a really vital role in the growth of Korea's vibrant democracy and the embedding of human rights into our national life. So we would uh, continue to urge strongly all the governments to work with civil society activists. Thank you. Thank you. Since uh, the time is running out, I will um, stick to my pitch because that's 60 minutes and it should be enough. First and foremost, we will have been a reliable and responsible partner, always ready to engage in a constructive dialogue and cooperation. 
We will have cooperated with all states, large and small, and we will have done more to promote universal membership. We will have supported civil society organizations and human rights defenders. Our membership will have resulted in a higher human rights standards and frameworks, in particular with regard to the right to freedom of expression, freedom of religion and belief, and equal rights for LGBTI persons, and gender equality and the rights of women and, and girls. OHHR will have a stronger capacity to support human rights council accountability mechanisms. When appropriate, we will have advocated the universality and authority of the ICC. SDGs will have been mainstreamed into the work of the Human Rights Council, and as a, re a result, the Human Rights Council Convention Agenda will have been strengthened. We hope to, we will be remembered in three years for our proactive engagement and our critical stance on the Human Rights Council. We will have played a key role in discussions on the Council's efficiency and working methods, including agenda item 7. We will have contributed to stronger ties between Geneva and New York in discussions on the Human Rights Council's status and review. In conclusion, we see the Human Rights Council membership as a responsibility and we will take full accountability for our actions and we remain ready to answer for the outcomes of our choices. Thank you. We think that special procedure uh, play a key role in the promotion and protection of human rights and Poland believes that scrutiny applies to all and then uh, the attention should be also given, should be paid to all, member, uh, all UN member states, not only those who have issued standing invitation, as Poland did, and maintains the standing invitation. Because the effective cooperation between special procedures and states requires transparency and willingness to engage constructively uh, from both sides. And as a stanch group supporter of special procedures, Poland believes that the role of the coordination committee of special procedures could be further reinforced in order to respond to emerging issues arising in the work and the working method of special procedures. I thank you. Thanks. Uh, to react to a question that, not a question, a comment that uh, uh, you put on the, on the screen. So, Brazil, regarding the internal situation in Brazil. So let me say, Brazil is a strong and robust democracy, ample space for democracy, civil society to speak. Uh, three powers, executive, judiciary, and legislative, they work in total independence. Corruption is being fought. President Bolsonaro has been elected with 57 million votes after a vibrant and very passionate election that was observed and legitimate by international observers. Uh, we are fighting now unemployment and passing reforms to increase the economy. On the social area, we are improving and strengthening the existing social programs. On migrants, we have the best, and I'm not being uh, being modest here. We have the best and the most progressive uh, migrant law. And we are receiving Venezuelans with open arms, open doors, give them shelters, food, unemployment, respect, and documentation. Thank you. I know that we would all like to hear more from each of the candidate countries, um, but we've managed to come in um, on time. Uh, and I appreciate it. I appreciate the audience. Uh, sorry that some of you, I think, did have questions that we weren't able to get to, but we did have to try to balance out uh, for each of the member states. Thank you so much for your participation. Thanks again to the co-sponsors and the organizers uh, for this very vibrant and important event. Thank you.